So yeah, we usually start with a half hour guided meditation and so I'll lead us in that. So just finding your way to a comfortable posture. Appreciating that awareness has the quality of inclusion, inclusion, and whatever arises at any of the six sense doors of seeing and hearing, tasting, touching, feeling with the skin and thinking. It doesn't have to be a problem. It's just the nature of the mind and body to be sensitive, to be aware in these ways, conscious. So we can begin just by acknowledging that fact that we are sensitive, that things are being known by the mind different objects of awareness coming and going. So we're taking the time at the beginning of the meditation to relax and to bring this perspective that whatever is being known is just the nature of the mind and body. Not personal in some real way. Just the nature of sensation of thought, of emotion, of sound, and all the other sense doors expressing themselves. And we can notice if this perspective helps us to relax, to let go of a desire for control or for judging our experience, evaluating judging ourselves based on the content of our awareness, what we're sensitive to. What would it be like to simply receive what is being known as objects being known by the mind? Simply that simply nature expressing itself. Could there be a lightness, an absence of personalizing and proliferating and speculating? There's already something being known, so we don't need to go out looking for a better object of awareness. Relaxing the body, relaxing the mind. It's not necessary to be tense in order to be aware. In fact, awareness is noticed more naturally when 
we're relaxed. Letting go of the habit of controlling And in order to give the mind something to do to replace its habits of endlessly thinking, we can invite the mind to take up an anchor, a primary object of meditation. Could be the sensations of sitting, simply receiving, tuning into those sensations, the pressure of the butt on the chair or cushion, hands, wherever they're placed, a whole body awareness, the uprightness of the spine, relaxing whatever muscles don't need to be tensed in order to sit. And we can come back to this primary object or some other aspect of your physical experience that feels neutral or somewhat pleasant. When you find that your mind is distracted, caught up in some drama, then we can give the mind something that's soothing, that's less agitating, simply to be aware of. We can learn a lot in this willingness to put down our habits of planning and worrying and simply attend to some aspect of physical experience. Noticing the soothing, relaxing, simplifying aspect of that that simplifying of our experience. It could be the field of hearing, just tuning into the sounds that come and go. It could be the soothing, perhaps soothing rhythm of breathing felt throughout the body in and out. So feel free to use a primary object if it helps the mind remember to relax and to orient around awareness, present moment awareness, and to put down what's not needed, what's agitating, what's complicating in favor of here and now, present moment awareness letting whatever is known be known. So let's continue in silence for some time, doing our best to sustain this interest in present moment awareness and using a primary object when it feels helpful, when the mind feels like it needs some simplifying, some support and simplifying.
we notice the relative space in the mind or peace in the mind, relative non-distraction, simplicity, and appreciate that, that will tend to strengthen those qualities. So we don't have to be forceful or tight or grasping simply through recognizing any wholesome qualities that are already present. Those can be recognized and strengthened, deepened, allowed to suffuse more of the space of awareness, including space of the body, feelings of calm in the body, relaxation, all of these wholesome qualities we can notice and appreciate. Encourage them, invite them to settle, to expand if they want to expand, to fill the space of awareness We can appreciate the quality of awareness itself. That capacity to recognize the present moment's experience. We don't need to do anything with it. Just be interested in this capacity that the mind has to simply know what's happening, know what's being known, you could say. Trusting that this simple awareness is wholesome. It's wholesome because when we're aware, when we're aware with wisdom, there's already interest, engagement, 
some level of understanding, even if it's just to know this is what's happening, that's a level of understanding in contrast to being unaware, not knowing what's happening. So appreciating just the simplicity of awareness and what it allows for this understanding, this knowing what's happening in a simple way, non-conceptual way. For the last minute or so, if your eyes have been closed, you could try practicing with your eyes open, gazing gently in front of you, letting go of directing the mind, making any personal effort to be aware, maybe noticing awareness continuing on its own. sitting right in the middle of our experience, not pushing anything away, not holding on, not caught up in any drama. Simply knowing what's here to be known without effort.
Thanks for your practice, everyone. Let's just take a minute if people want to stretch, do what you need to do to release any tension. So welcome everyone, nice to be together. So for those who may have um, not have joined other weeks, um, I've been leading this session twice a month on Thursdays, the second and fourth Thursday of the month since January. And I've been moving through a list of 10 virtues called the Paramis. Um, so we went through generosity and ethical conduct and renunciation and energy and wisdom and truthfulness and patience. And I think that's all of them that we've covered, unless I missed one. So now we're on number eight, which is resolution or determination. So yeah, excited to, to share some thoughts on this and then we can open it up for a discussion after, after a little talk. But maybe just a couple words on this list. And um, I think we could all recognize that these qualities are uh, praiseworthy, um, things that, that we would say are good ideas then the last two that we'll cover are goodwill and equanimity. Um, but like the title of this um, series is Cultivating Virtue as a Support for Liberation. So that's really the context is not just cultivating virtue in order to be virtuous and seen as virtuous, which isn't bad, you know, and that's definitely can be a, uh, a corollary or a, a side benefit is just um, our reputation. If we're known as a more kind person as opposed to a more angry person, it really helps. It helps in our life. Um, but on a deeper level, we're cultivating these qualities because they liberate our hearts. They help our hearts step out of their habits of a more self-concerned orientation and maybe question some of our habits and try on a different perspective that um, puts something above, puts something higher than just our short-term short -term gain or advantage. Um, and so, yeah, just this list, I think, is a great thing to have memorized and to bring to mind because it can help us clarify uh, what not like yeah, in, especially in daily life, in situations that can be complicated or difficult or challenging, you know, so often in those situations, just the habit of our mind is, what can I do to make this easier for me or to get what I want? And from the point of view of the Parmis, it's okay to, uh, you know, to have those thoughts and they may, you know, we do want to, we don't want to make life harder for ourselves, but we can also see that, um, yeah, there's only so much smoothing out that's possible in life. And so when there are challenges, we can see them as opportunities to develop these qualities that can help us not be so caught up in the ordinary, you know, imperfections that come, come with life and relationships and so on. So they're a different orientation, a different perspective where, you know, instead of seeing, oh, life is so hard, which it is, <laughs> and that's a, that's a problem or that's a mistake or it's my fault or it's someone else's fault. It's just sort of like, this is sort of the way it is on some level. Not that it's always hard, but, you know, it's not perfect. And how could that actually be uh, support for developing qualities of heart that let me meet that with more skill and grace and humor and kindness. Uh, Ajahn Suchitto, this British monk who wrote a great book that we've been reading, some of us, called Parmi, 
he uses the phrase great heart sometimes, or maybe he used to use it more often, but that sense of this capacity we have as humans to not just be on sort of the animal level. In Buddhism, animals are sort of seen operating more or less, and I think it, in reality, it depends on the animal, but kind of on a survival mode. And humans, we can be on that mode a lot of the time, whether it's physical or psychological survival. But we also have this, this, this capacity of stepping outside of that and acting from a place of real generosity or real integrity, you know, commitment to non-harming, even when, you know, when things are messy or when things are challenging. And we can see how these qualities kind of bring us out of that narrow kind of mindset and open us up to, you could say, our human potential. And it's not a personal potential. I mean, it's not, it is in a sense personal, but it's transpersonal is another word Ajahn Suchitta uses. It's, it's bigger than ourselves. It's not my generosity is somehow different than your generosity. It's the nature of a generous heart is that it, it uh, opens and it feels connected. It wants to, to, it recognizes our commonality and, um, and um, gives up the habit of stinginess and hoarding or, and just kind of expands, includes. That's just one example. So I, I've loved this list for many years and have used it in my practice and, and just highly recommend if you haven't exploring it and um, yeah, seeing what, what might be inspiring in that list for you. And today, as we talk about resolution, I think we'll touch on a lot of the different paramis because resolution is really uh, what allows us to take these virtues or values or any value or idea, spiritual idea, take it from just a conceptual level to a practical level. Um, so it, it underlies all of the rest of them and and makes them more than just a nice idea it's something that it, we we feel enough confidence in say goodwill like that goodwill is functional and supports harmony and supports our heart most importantly our heart being free of ill will the ill will that can torment us we feel confident enough in that that we have some resolution behind it like i'm really gonna do my best to bring this quality up, even in situations that are challenging, to not have ill will. Do, is that possible uh, more and more? Um, <clears throat> so I want to read a description of uh, this quality of resolution from Ajahn Suchitto. He says, recognizing the potency of a firm heart, I aspire to hold intentions that are enriching and to ward off vacillation on one hand and forceful goal-seeking on the other. He's always so precise in his language, which I appreciate. I like that word potency and firm, potency of a firm heart. So there's, I think, in this quality, there's this balance, which he points to as well, where it's not this sort of um, unthinking adherence to some ideal, and then we just get dogmatic or we get self-righteous, or we get self-punitive or, you know, yeah, really beating ourselves up or something. And on the other hand, but it's recognizing that nothing really, if we're honest, if I'm honest in my life, nothing really of value has come about without some application. Even effort feels like too strong of a word, but like some recognition of what is important and what's of value and some sort of getting behind that in some concrete way. I mean, a simple example for a lot of us who have been practicing for a while is just to meditate, just to recognize the value of that. In this world where there's so much to do, we have responsibilities, we have to earn a living, we have relationships, we, have, we want to be responsible, engaged citizens. And with all of that, recognizing the value of putting things aside and attending to what's most direct and when we recognize the value of that and how it supports us in all the other parts of our life, 
then for a lot of us, there's this strong commitment to that, to, to practicing meditation and mindfulness more generally in our life. So that's the first point I want to make is that this resolution really needs wisdom behind it. And Ajahn Suchitta makes the point that this, this quality comes later in the list of parami, it's number eight out of 10, because we need to uh, know which qualities we want to be resolved on, we want to commit to. So throughout our life, just through trial and error, and then if we stumble upon spiritual teachings, we'll try out different um, orientations and intentions. And if we're being mindful and we're learning from our experience, then we come to, to learn, oh, yeah, goodwill is more reliable than ill will for my own well-being. A heart, my heart being having goodwill as a sort of basis, as a um, basic orientation towards others as opposed to ill will or hostility or suspicion just feels better. And the more we see that, then the more there can be some resolution around that or commitment around that. But nobody can do this for us, so that's why the wisdom and discernment uh, is just something that, that we need to, to carry along with any commitments and resolutions. And we've probably all had the experience of committing to things where we didn't have enough, res uh, enough wisdom or discernment behind it. We just commit to things because other people tell us it's a good idea or it's what's expected or whatever. So this, this quality of discernment is really important because this quality of resolution can sort of be a, a strong force and it it's really is related to willpower, um, which we need, you know, we need willpower to do anything, so including to, to have a practice. So it's not that willpower is bad, it does have its, its limits. We can't, you know, just through will, you know, say I'm gonna be, I'm gonna sit down and, and get enlightened in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but we can have, we can aim a direction and it takes that wisdom and discernment to sense what direction do I wanna go in? And this is helpful because otherwise, um, yeah, if we make commitments or resolutions without that, then we can get disappointed and, and burned like, oh, I committed to meditating every day for a year and I'm still not enlightened. Well, we had some maybe unrealistic expectation. And it's related to what's actually inspiring for us, what, and, um, yeah, so it's, it's not just an ideal, but something that we have some confidence in through our own direct experience, ideally. At first, maybe we take it on faith or because we have an inspiring teacher, but eventually, through our own experience, we, you know, the deepest kind of confidence comes from when we see it with our own, with our own experience. Oh, these qualities lead towards happiness, unburdening of my heart, and these qualities lead towards a more burdening more burdening. So then once we have some confidence in a direction, you know, whatever way that takes shape, whether it's more obvious um, or more general, more discreet, more specific or more general, then resolution is sort of, whether it's an actual resolution like a New Year's resolution or something about something specific in our life, I'm going to meditate every day, I'm going to give up this habit that isn't helpful, or if it's just more of a direction, like for this year, I'm going to really um, tune in to, to goodwill or one of the other virtues. That sort of um, acting on that is, is a way of strengthening it. Um, that making that commitment is a way of strengthening it and sort of activating it. So I see this sort of as, as we're supporting ourselves because we know that our, our minds are, you know, those of us who are not yet fully awakened, our minds are a mix of wholesome qualities and unwholesome qualities. So 
we sort of need to support ourselves in remembering, you know, the wholesome qualities and strengthening those. And, and this is, I think this is the quality that really does that. It's the quality that says not only, you know, are there wholesome and unwholesome, but I have enough confidence in which are wholesome that I, you know, I can say something about that and I can say that to myself, even if it's just in my own mind, do that, follow that or whatever, you know, pay attention to that because I care. And it's so it's not coming out of a, a harsh harshness, but it's because I care for my own well-being and for the well-being of others, for the well-being of everyone who has to interact with me. Like, let's commit. And, you know, we need to have, like I was saying, a certain amount of confidence in order to do that. But this really supports us in terms of having a sense of that we're not helpless. You know, there's a lot that's outside of our control and our own minds are what comes up in our mind, you know, what, what thought pops into our head. It's not under our control, but our wisdom recognizing what direction we want to move in, that's a, a powerful guiding force. It kind of is a filter on what we, how we're looking at the world, how we're looking at our life. And so, yeah, agency that we can, you know, we can intervene, we can have a shape of direction is really, really important. And it's what all the Buddha's teachings are based on. You know, the Buddha talked a lot about effort, not in order for us to get tight and think we can make things happen through pure will, willpower, but because it is a, uh, a factor, it is a condition that um, has results. And I like when I talk about effort to bring in this kind of heartfulness, because especially with resolution, I think a lot of it is, is less like doing something necessarily, although doing something can be great, signing up for a retreat, you know, sitting down to meditate. But all that's coming out of some heart connection to something that we that we have a um, you know respect for another point um, that i think is important is that there is a cost to this you know there's a benefit of feeling like yeah there's you know we're we're setting a direction and that feels good we're not helpless but there's also a cost, which is that anything that we commit to or have a sense of clarity around requires that we're letting go of something else because we only have so much time and energy and resources. So this is where renunciation, one of the earlier paramis, comes in. And I appreciated this point. Um, Tennis Robiku made this point. I was reading this book on the paramis that he has called Good Heart, Good Mind. And he made this point just about that with renunciation and with resolution, we are letting go every time. Every time that we um, orient around something, it's always at the expense of something else. So the question then is just, you know, is that a good trade? Are we trading up? Are we trading a, le a more short-term happiness for a longer-term, more satisfying happiness? You know, to be resolved on goodwill, we might have to, you know, we're, we might have to let go of some really smart retort that we could have that would really put someone in their place. But, you know, that might have some very short-term pleasure associated with it, but long-term, you know, probably doesn't make people like us and, and we have to watch our back or something. So... You know, and the place where this is really obvious is in renunciation around um, pursuing sense pleasures as an ultimate source of happiness, which is something that is talked about a lot in Buddhism and can be misunderstood as a judgment of sense pleasure. But it's just recognizing the limitations of it. We've all, you know, the three of us here have probably all experienced sense pleasures of all kinds but we're still not fully satisfied because that because they're temporary and so 
in pursuing a deeper sources of happiness, you know, even just to sit down and meditate, is to give up 30 minutes where we could be listening to music or having an interesting conversation or whatever. So there is this uh, centrality of renunciation in pursuing whatever spiritual direction we're, you know, we're interested in. And resolution is what keeps that, keeps us, uh, keeps us, re keeps reminding us of why we're doing that. So it's not, again, to be punitive or because we should, it's the sense of this is actually a more reliable direction or a more reliable source of happiness. Like in the case of renunciation, the happiness of not needing to be dependent on always being stimulated by pleasant experience maybe is ultimately more satisfying. That non-dependence, that freedom, than whatever temporary satisfaction we might get out of some experience. So this is sort of turning the, the truth of the temporariness of sense pleasures into a, not you know, something that's wrong with the nature of the universe, but just into an opportunity to learn about our mind's dependence on that and how we can be free of that. So that's really, it's, it's aiming towards a deeper happiness. And that's why people do things like renunciation. It's not to prove anything, hopefully, or to you know, be self-depriving, self but it's to see how much the mind is dependent. If we're honest, how much are we dependent on just whatever, whatever it is for us, a good novel, you know, sex, food, money, uh, praise, you know, all the, the usual suspects. And again, these things aren't bad. They're, you know, it's nice. And there is a real gratification in sense pleasure. And the question is, does that lead anywhere lasting in terms of lasting happiness? And if, the, if, if through our own direct experience, the answer is no, then are we willing in moments to give up a sense pleasure in order to pursue, you know, a freedom, a deeper freedom that's not dependent on sense pleasure. So Ajahn Suchito obviously as a monk um, had a lot of opportunity to practice with renunciation. And um, I appreciate it. I'll just read a little bit from the chapter in this book about one, one renunciation practice he did. And, and resolve resolution practice he did. And I appreciate it because like from the outside, we might think, yeah, people who do, you know, living as a monastic, you're celibate, you're not really supposed to, uh, I think, you know, in, indulge in entertainments much. You just, you know, you, you do work, um, but you chant, you meditate. But even in that, in that um, environment, there is leeway. You know, people I think have different Lifestyles. I know Ajahn Suchito has written a lot of, of books, so it's not like they're just meditating all the time. But he tells this story in the book about just recognizing how much his mind was dependent on, he says, I was very fond of ideas, and I always wanted to have bright and interesting things in my mind. So just recognizing that, you know, that that was a dependence in his mind. And... So he says, I determined a few things to work against that trend. This is during a, a retreat, a three-month retreat. I resolved not to read anything because I was aware of how much time I'd spend casually reading stuff just to fill the holes in the day and keep the mind stimulated. And then he goes on to say that, you know, in, in refraining from that, and then he was also doing a practice where he wasn't, uh, he wasn't laying down to sleep, so you sleep a lot less. And his mind was just very blurry and, you know, kind of sleep deprived. And just to be with that kind of mind, nothing really interesting, just kind of just dreary and inconsequential. And that it brought up, it was the opportunity to practice compassion in a really deep way for our minds that are so dependent on stimulation. And when in lack of stimulation, how they get you know, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, and especially these days when we're so conditioned to, 
you know, to never be in want of stimulation, you know, just to have to wait five minutes in line or whatever it might be. I see in my mind the impatience, the restlessness. So the point of this isn't, you know, that somehow reading is bad or something, but it's getting to the heart of where our minds are, um, yeah, our dependence and our, have these habits um, needing to be propped up. And what's so wrong? What's so bad about kind of the, the openness, openness of the mind? Maybe there's something there we don't want to feel, we don't want to see. And how much freedom is there if we're always, um, yeah, filling up the space in order to avoid that? And how much more freedom would there be if we were totally willing to see the mind as it is in all of its glory? So I like that example, even though it can seem a little extreme. But the result, you know, he says at the end, the mind gets moody, bored, and lifeless. When you take away, or the nature of the mind is to need something to engage with, then you feel what it's like if there's nothing interesting or worthwhile to do. The mind gets moody, bored, and lifeless, and you have to learn to simply hold it as you would a baby, holding it, rocking it, bearing with it, listening to it. This is great for strengthening and broadening the heart, building up tolerance, and letting go of conceit. Yeah, that part of our mind is just this bored toddler that always wants to be entertained. And just that, you know, that compassion, that willingness to just hold that, just hold that. Um, maybe that's what it really wants, is to be held. So the patience is really part of this too. And with any resolution, uh, you know, like in that example, obviously there, there needed to be patience with, you know, you make the resolution and you expect that there's going to be resistance. And then there's patience with that, with that resistance. Yeah, so that there's some value in, in going against the stream of our conditioning, the stream of, against the stream of our broader societal conditioning, at times at least. And that's why it takes resolution. So resolutions needed, um, yeah, to back up anything, really, that takes any amount of commitment but it also takes patience so that we're not just expecting results right away. Um, and we're kind of sustaining that connection to what we value throughout. Um, not just, yeah, waiting for, for some outcome. One practice that Ajahn Suchitta recommends and that I I try to do, although I did it today, but I hadn't done it in a long time, I realized, just because I, like, again, the habit of filling up time is so predominant. But his encouragement is to just sit on the couch for five minutes, and not even meditate, but just do nothing. And just notice all that comes up in the mind around that. Oh, I shouldn't be doing anything, or I shouldn't be doing nothing, um, just thinking of all the things we need to do and to just sit and witness all that, like, I, you know, kind of related to, yeah, to what Ajahn Suchitta was, was describing. In my experience, when I do that, there tends to be a, a, a lot, a surprising amount of resistance to just to sit and do nothing for five minutes and a lot of ideas about what I should do or and just a lot of agitation, like, because it's kind of like stopping and then feeling all the agitation that, is generally there. But with just that encouragement to, I, you know, I don't have to do anything. I can do those things after five minutes. There's, there's sometimes this moment where uh, all that, you know, witnessing of that stuff, I, 
you, if you get the opportunity, I get the opportunity to just see, oh, this is just the conditioning of the mind. And I don't have to act on it right now. And it, just that little break, that perspective, I think can be surprisingly powerful, even if it's just to see this is sort of what's fueling a lot of our life, is maybe that compulsion and that's just that agitation. So we can, you know, we can have resolution around creating moments like that, times like that where we kind of step outside of our habitual drives and just give it things a chance to be seen, to be known. So resolution doesn't have to just be about doing things, but it can also just be the resolution to not do things. <laughs> Because if we're always doing things, we don't have the opportunity to assess what we're doing and what direction it's going in. So yeah, again, resolution, like I said at the beginning, it really is about wisdom. It's really connected to wisdom. So it's, it's not just more is better, which often we can get that message. Just the more you do, you know, the busier you are. Oh, I'm so busy. I've got so much going on. You know, that's like, it's sort of a, uh, a sign of, I don't know, it's sort of praised in our societies to be busy. And obviously there's, you know, a lot of good work that we can do with our lives, a lot of interesting things we can do. But the question just is, what, what is the motivation there? And so that discernment is what allows us to assess well, where is this really heading? Where is all this activity heading? And is it the direction I want to go? And in order to even assess that, we need to step back a little bit. It's amazing how much, like with that five minutes sitting on the couch, how much you can learn or how much I feel I can learn just in doing that, just in the perspective that it offers on just the ordinary drives of my mind because then I you get up and you go about your day but suddenly it doesn't maybe things don't feel quite as urgent because you've realized oh, it's just all this this drive in my mind constantly pushing me forward and it's not very pleasant uh, Ajahn Suchito said too if you don't set a let me find it he said, if you won't create your own life, the world will create it for you. And I think that's part of this, is just seeing, we see at a certain point, the force of our conditioning just acting itself out. And there's some understandable fear that can arise there, like, yeah, someone should intervene. And the uplifting, inspiring, empowering part of this is the Buddha said, it's possible. It's possible, and we know this from modern neuro neuroscience. It's possible to rewire the brain, but it, it, it's really that discernment, that understanding, that seen through trial and error, which qualities are blameless and which ones are blameworthy, that backs up that resolution. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing in a way, and in terms of where we get our motivation, especially when we're earlier in our practice, we do rely on, on teachings, and that's why it's so wonderful to have teachings like the Buddha's teachings and other, and, you know, other wise people that give us a bit of a map. I'll just read a few quotes um, and then maybe open it up for a discussion. So Charlotte Joko Beck is a, is a wonderful Zen teacher. She's dead now, um, but was, a, yeah, just a wonderful teacher. She's got several books. I'm not sure which book this is from, but she writes, Life is a series of endless disappointments, <laughs> and it's wonderful because it doesn't give us what we want. To go down this path takes courage, and many people in this lifetime will not do it. We're all at different places on the path, which is fine. Only a very few who are enormously persistent 
and who take everything in life as an opportunity and not as an insult will finally understand. Eventually for a few people, sometimes intermittently, but finally most of the time, there is what Christians call the peace which passeth all understanding. As the Dharma talk, this all sounds forbidding, yet the people who endlessly practice are the ones who are enjoying life. This is the gateless gate to joy. People who understand and have the courage to do this are the ones who eventually know what joy is. I'm not talking about endless happiness. There is no such thing but joy. This is a bit of an enigmatic um, paragraph, but there's something in it that really speaks to me. And I think it's that resolution, um, that sense that, because in my experience, there's always an opportunity, there's always rationale, justification to get upset with life. And yet, does that lead to peace? And if we're really interested in peace, like she says, again, it's not about being a doormat and we don't have wisdom, we can't recognize what's right and wrong and take care of ourselves. But in terms of where we're really looking for our deepest happiness and freedom, um, you know, just that resolution to take, like she says, to take everything in life, not as an insult, but as an opportunity. What is that, you know, what does that call forth? What does that ask of us? And maybe there's actual freedom there, you know, not just, you know, you know, this kind of, um, yeah, bear, you know, feeling burdened by life. And obviously we need wisdom here and we can take that as an ideal and kind of do spiritual bypass and be the person who doesn't have a problem with anything and just pretend, but that doesn't lead to freedom. It's actually the meeting of all of our resistance, of all of our, you know, wanting things to be a certain way, wanting people to be a certain way, really seeing that, feeling that, and recognizing that maybe there's a possibility not to deny you know, any of that, but to make room for it to be as it is and to have a heart that's open in, in despite of that. And that there's joy there, the joy of um, engaging with life, not, have, not needing to turn away of you know, being in relationship, being in, in connection with things as they are, not as thing, not things as we think they should be. The people who endlessly practice are the ones who are enjoying life. She also said somewhere else, we have to practice with all of our might for the rest of our lives. And again, from a certain point of view, that sounds like, oh, I don't want to do that. But what do we imagine the alternative is? And I think we, we do. I think there is this, um, we do have this idea that distraction is better than, than being present in our life, you know, tuning out in different ways. But that's maybe an assumption, you know. What maybe the question is, what, you know, what supports do we need, like these paramis, you know, would life be so hard if we, if our heart was full of goodwill towards ourselves, towards others? Would, our, would life be so hard if there was this patience with ourselves, with our imperfections and with others? So again, it's, these are just invitations for contemplation, but I think for me, it, it just points to, this whole topic points to how we can want, maybe we can hear some spiritual teachings that are more about being maybe passive or receiving, and we can really want to get there because that sounds really nice. But as long as the mind is deluded, there is some, you know, there's some wisdom that needs to be applied. And, and the question is, could that actually be enlivening? Like she says, could that be joyful? Could it be fun? You know? Oh, maybe I'll read one more quote and then open it up. This is from Saida Utejaniya. 
The Buddha didn't urge us to be practicing all the time for nothing. It's because he knew about the full extent of moha, which is delusion, that he left us this instruction. Just try stopping. Try to stop meditation for a while, and you'll see the strength of defilements. If this side of wisdom stops, a party of defilements will just come in and cover everything. That's what I mean by not being able to pause. That's why I also say never give up. Either there is momentum on the wisdom side or there will be momentum on the defilement side. If you were to let go of this wisdom momentum, even for a bit, it will take quite a lot to begin again. Beginning again is not that easy. That's why you can't let it stop. Imagine going all the way. So, provocative teaching there. So yeah, I'll open it up and, and see what thoughts people have on this topic. Um, you know, it could be interesting to hear kind of on both sides maybe how we feel like, um, yeah, we're just learning about how not to be too tight, you know, and forceful and goal-oriented, but then also learning about, you know, um, the value of having an orientation, a direction, how that can really be enriching and enlivening and not just like a burden. Yeah, or any questions that have come up from anything I've shared. Um, I don't know, Cam, if you want to just get a little closer and then if you want to speak, I can turn the computer. But yeah, I'll open it up. Thanks for your kind attention.